Hi everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to this uh, SR webinar on uh, sperm preparation techniques and how to improve sperm preparation. Because this is a smaller lecture, I'm also going to cover sperm freezing and preparation for sperm freezing in this webinar as well. So um, just to so just a, a small uh, check. Uh, can you hear me clearly? And uh, if you can see the slides, uh, if all that is sorted, we can begin uh, the webinar. Great. <clears throat> so the topic of today's webinar is semen preparation, what, why, and how. And why we've uh, actually uh, chosen this topic is that there are a lot of clinicians, even embryologists, who still uh, feel that, still feel confused. Uh, about which preparation technique to use when. Also, there are a lot of advances which have actually crept up in sperm preparation. So the purpose of this webinar is to actually appraise all of you about all of this. Um, those who can't hear me, can you please refresh your page? page and uh, I would request you to use Google Chrome uh, as the preferred uh, way of uh, actually watching this webinar. Right. So like I was telling you uh, earlier, we have had a lot of advances in sperm preparation. And why do we need these advances? Because uh, there is a huge rise in male factor infertility as of now. Uh, if you notice the current counts, the average sperm concentration is on a decline. Uh, we've had, so if I talk about 1960s, 1970s, the average sperm concentration was 91 million. And now it's fallen down to 39 million on an average. Sperm morphology is also on a decline from 64% to 18%. Uh, percentage of patients who whose TMSC actually clogged between 0 to 6 or 0 to 5 million, that has also uh, actually increased. So these are things that we need to really now worry about. Why do we need sperm processing? And that, this is also a question which is very, very important. Uh, give me one second. I think there are people who are having issues with the volume. Okay, great. Can every, everyone hear me? Perfect. So why do we need sperm processing? And that is also a question which we all need to now answer. Now, a criteria for a good sperm selection, and that is uh, the only one of the most important factors why we need sperm freezing, right? So sperm selection is one of the major criteria. And the criteria for good sperm selection is that you eliminate the seminal plasma, decapacitation factors, and all the debris which is present in the sample. You also want to eliminate the dysfunctional ROS producing sperms. You also want to eliminate the leukocytes. The You want to reduce the bacterial content. You want to enrich functional sperms in the pellet. Uh, sperms which have a good DNA integrity, sperms which have an acrosomal reaction, uh, normal sperm morphology, etc. All of this has to be cost effective, has to be easy to perform, and also has to allow large volumes of ejaculate to be prepared together. So these are the reasons why we actually need sperm processing. Right. Now, there are a lot of methods for sperm preparation, and these methods are divided into two parts. First is the separation of spermatozoa from the seminal plasma. And the second type of preparation techniques is basically separation of seminal plasma, as well as selection based on sperm quality. So we actually divide sperm preparation into these two categories. Now, when we only want to remove the seminal plasma, the preparation technique that we utilize here is sperm wash or sp simple washing. When we want to actually use a selection technique, that is where migration or filtration or even centrifugation on a colloid actually come into play. So migration basically stands for swim up. Filtration is when you use glass pool or beads or certain membranes. And centrifugation on a colloid basically means discontinuous uh, gradient centrifugation where you use density gradient to actually uh, prepare the semen sample. Now, 
again why do we want to prepare a semen sample so this is a video showing a raw sample on a maculus chamber and you can actually see that the sperms here uh, are moving quite slowly you can't really uh, you have a lot of other debris which is present in the plasma and such a sample you can't really use to inseminate what happens to a semen sample once it's prepared is it will look something like this so the motility becomes fantastic because all of that debris all of that viscosity from the seminal plasma is gone and you're only concentrating good sperms uh, into the pellet and that is why if you have such a sample post wash these are the samples that are going to result in um, better outcomes especially with iui and even with ivf right so now let's come to the basic techniques first and uh, I'm going to show you a few videos as well. So if you don't understand anything here, or if you want me to repeat a step, please uh, uh, type in in the question uh, in the chat bar, and I'll come. I'll actually try and answer that. So the first technique that we use um, is simple washing, and like I mentioned earlier, simple washing is a technique when you only want to remove the seminal plasma and not the debris, not the bacteria, not the non-motile forms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what we're going to do here is we mix equal parts of semen sample with a sperm preparation media like HDF or hippies or mops and you just mix it well and you spin it for about five minutes so generally in our lab I spin it for five minutes you can also spin it for, spin it for 10 minutes if you want but a general five minute time for sperm uh, centrifugation is sufficient so once you uh, centrifuge this what will happen is that everything which is present inside the uh, semen sample actually gets concentrated at the bottom of the test tube. So you want to remove all the supernatant and only leave that pellet behind. And once you have that pellet, you just add some fresh uh, 0.3 ml of fresh media into that pellet, mix it well. And then this kind of technique should only be used for ICSI, right? Why do I not want, want to use it for IUI or IVF? is because I'm concentrating everything which is present in the seminal uh, fluid, um, like all the non-motile sperms, all the morphologically abnormal sperms, everything which is there in the sample gets concentrated into the pellet, right? So that is why I would not recommend this uh, to be used for IUI or even for um, IVF, right? So these are the things that you need to remember. So there are people who ask me, why do you actually do a uh, simple wash then? Can anyone answer that question for me? So when um, you're not getting, um, when you're actually concentrating even dead sperms, non-motile sperms, et cetera, et cetera, into the pellet, why do you want to still use a uh, simple wash? So Nivedita has an answer here. She says that there is less ROS. Anyone else has any, any answers for this question? So basically, less ROS is one of the uh, answers here. But when once you have a sample which is very poor, right, severe or severe oligospermia, like Kubera uh, just put put the answer in. So when you have that kind of a sample and you only wanting to do ICSI for this, this sample, and you know that the embryologist is going to select the sperms. Uh, so in those scenarios, a simple wash techniques works perfectly because you're not producing ROS, you're not damaging the sperms anymore. And then the embryologist can pick up the motile sperms, etc., and just inject it into the uh, oocyte. So in those scenarios, a simple wash works perfectly, right? Now, the second technique that um, is available here is swim up. And swim up also is of two types. First one is swim up from ejaculate and the second one is a pellet swim up. Now, I will first uh, cover the swim up from the ejaculate because this is something which is more commonly used in most of the laboratories. So what you what this technique does is that it exploits the intrinsic motility of the sperm. So like the name suggests, you're going to layer sperm, you're going to layer media over the sperm and what happens is that the sperms which are the fastest or they're moving the best swim up to the top and then you pick up the uh, supernatant centrifuge it and you only get those fastest or the most motile sperms into your final pellet or uh, the final thing that you're going to use right so how do we do this i'll have a, i have a video for it so you can actually i can play it again 
right so first thing that you do for any kind of sperm preparation technique is that you label the sample uh, adequately or label the test tubes with at least three identification markers now for swim up the first thing that i want to do is i want to put in one ml of media in each of the test tubes i'm going to use four round bottom tubes um, which are of 5 ml volume for preparing this sample second thing that i want to do is i want to underlay the sample so what we are going to do is we are going to load 0.5 ml of uh, sample in a uh, pipette and gently release the sample below the media now this is this step is also very important you could you could uh, first put in the sample and then put in the media why do we not want to do that can anyone answer that question why are we underlaying this sample now this is a very important step because uh, there are a few people typing so let me wait for their answer but you can see that the embryologist here actually is uh, layering so uh, carefully so that there is uh, you actually avoid any kind of mix up uh, of the medias uh, ankita says that there is less dis disturbance saraswati says that to get a good interface but what you want to do here is that understand so if if i have a tube which has which i'm putting sample in first and then i put the media later what happens is that the media being lighter creates a current and what happens is that the top layer of the sample will actually get mixed into the whole of the whole of the media and that is something that i want to avoid because i want the cleanest uh, possible sample later on right and that is the reason why i will put in media first and then gently uh, load the sample below the media so that's one of the techniques which you can use for uh, preparing a swim up sample now understand this so this is how your swim up sample should look like once it's done because mostly swim ups we in generally tend to use swim up for uh, ivf so we try and prepare them in fertilization media uh try and prepare them in fertilization media so this goes back into the incubator and this has to sit for about 45 minutes uh for the sperms to come to the top and then only you can start the post processing of such a sample right if you're using htf or if you're using hippies for swim up you don't really need an incubator for this and you can actually actually put the tubes in a test tube warmer or also on a warm block and they can be on your laminar table itself so these are again small small things to understand now once we are done with 45 minutes what you need to do is again prepare a conical tube for the second part of this uh, preparation technique right and again it has to have the same identification markers of uh, the patient you take out the uh, samples from the incubator or wherever you've kept it again sterile precautions are very very important having a clean surface or a clean laminar table is also very very important change your pipettes use a fresh pipette and then what you want to do is you want to actually aspirate all of the supernatant so i'm going to show you so this is after 45 minutes and you can actually see that this supernatant has also has become a little turbid so this also tells me that the swim up has worked here and there are sperms which are going which i'm going to get from the supernatant try and aspirate as much as possible without touching the semen sample which you loaded and then you accumulate all of the tubes or all of the supernatants together into a conical tube right and then you just want to centrifuge it at uh, about 1000 rpm for 5 minutes to get a pellet which you could use for iui or ivf for even for icsi so this is the basic uh, principle and the basic uh, preparation of a swim up sample if you have any questions regarding swim up uh, i'll be very very happy to answer them at this moment itself so just to go uh, about this technique again what you do is you take 3 to 4 tubes you uh, put 1 ml of uh, the sperm preparation media and this media depends on what you wanting to do so if you wanting to do iui it you'll probably use htf if you wanting to do ivf you'll use uh, fertilization media right so uh, 1 ml of media in each of the four tubes underlay 0.5 ml of semen sample uh, in each of the tubes leave it for about 30 to 45 minutes after that you pull the supernatants into a conical tube spin it at 1200 or 1000 rpm for about 5 to 6 minutes 
discard the supernatant, suspend the pellet again in 0.5 ml of media, mix and check the prepared sample and use for IUI or IVF or even for ICSI if you want to want to do that. So basically this is your swim up technique. Now there are people who uh, actually do this uh, preparation technique in a single tube and what they do is uh, they tilt the tube at a 45 degree angle or a 60 degree angle. Now can anyone tell me why you want to tilt this uh, test tube? Looking at the image above, uh, do you have any answers for this? We'll try and try and be as interactive as possible because that's how uh, we're going to learn more. So Ankita, you have the right answer. So does Saraswati and so does uh, Nivedita. So what we do when we tilt the test tube is that we are increasing the surface area and the yield of a swim up. Uh, or the final yield of the swim up is actually dependent on the amount of surface area that you have. Now, my technique of doing swim up is when I, I use four tubes. When I'm using four tubes, I'm increasing the surface area by four times, right? Because it's going to have the same surface area in four of the tubes. But if you want to do it in a single tube, tilting it uh, at a 45 degree angle or a 60 degree angle is actually going to help you in uh, increasing the surface area of contact and ultimately increasing the amount of sperms that can actually come up. So this is uh, absolutely essential if you're using a single tube. Now the next uh, preparation technique uh, which is commonly used, which is probably one of the gold standards uh, for sperm preparation in an IVF laboratory is gradient centrifugation or which is commonly known as uh, density gradient. Now this technique is based on different uh, densities and the ability of these densities to separate out uh, different sizes of sperms and different sizes of cells. So basically all the densities, these densities which are present uh, inside the preparation media act like a sieve and they try and eliminate the morphologically abnormal sperms and also the RBCs and the WBCs which are present in the sample and only the morphologically normal sperms actually come into the final pellet. So this is a basic principle of a density gradient centrifugation. Now, what you want to do here is that in this scenario, what are you going to do? Like in that, in swim up, we were using underlay. In this scenario, we're using overlay. So, so we start with the heaviest density first, which is a 90% density. We'll put in about 1 ml of 90% density, top it up with 1 ml of 45% if you're using a double density and top it up with 2 ml of semen sample. So you have 2 ml of densities together and you have 2 ml of semen sample. And then you centrifuge this at 1500 RPM or about 500 Gs based on your centrifuge that you're using. And this centrifugation happens for about 15 minutes, right? And in these 15 minutes, you're going to get a separation, which is something like this. So your seminal plasma is going to stay on top you will have your white blood cells, which are the largest cells, which will actually separate at the first interface. Then your abnormal non-motile sperms will actually separate in the first layer itself. Your immotile normal sperms will actually separate out here. And only the viable sperms, which have good motility, which have good morphology, come into the final pellet. So this is basically how uh, density gradient works. Right now, I have a video for this as well. So, like I mentioned earlier, we are going to start with naming the sample or labeling the test tube, and it has to have at least three identification markers. And I'm really specifying and uh, actually uh, specifying on three identification markers because in our country we have a lot of common names. So, having three markers actually helps us in avoiding any kind of mix up uh, which can happen in the laboratory. So we start with the heaviest density first, which is 90%. And these densities usually come as single packs or single use packs, so you can use them. And you actually take the whole volume and put it into the conical tube. Once you've done layering the 90%, change your pipette with a fresh pipette, start layering the 45%. This changing of pipettes is also very, very important because you don't want any kind of mixing of the densities, um, which will which can actually uh, you don't want any kind of mixing which will come up here. 
and this step is also very important in the sense that you have to be very gentle when you're loading on the second density so if you're trying to notice here what we're doing is we're trying to create a very nice smooth column of movement of the second density over the first density so that we get a good interface of separation when you get a good interface of separation that is when you will have the best kind of uh, separation of the sperms now tejal has a question and that is can rbc's get separated in the density gradient now this is a tricky question in the sense that uh, when you're using a density gradient what you have to understand is the size of the sperm and the size of the rbc are somewhat similar but the rbc is a little little larger as compared to the sperm so in some scenarios you might get separation but it will not be the clearest right so you might still have certain rbcs which will come into the pellet just because the size of the densities would not compensate for separating out the size of the rbc so you will not get the cleanest sample if you have a la if you have actually a large number of rbcs present in such a scenario i would recommend using an rbc lysis buffer which actually lyses the rbcs and then following it up with a sperm preparation technique right so if you noticed here what we tried to do is okay so paras you have a question here can we underlay the 90% now again if you want to try and do that you can do that uh, because being heavier in the 90% density is going to stay below but generally uh, to get even layers uh, it's easier when you overlay in such a scenario right now another tip uh tip that i can give you guys here if you're not getting that separation uh technique or the layers between the densities is that once you've put the 90% uh just introduce a small bubble on the side of the test tube right and then load the 45% just over the bubble right so when you load it over the bubble that bubble acts like a shock absorber and then it gives you a very nice uh, layer of 45% over the 50% and that bubble will float up right so you can use the same bubble to load the semen sample as well and it will act like a shock absorber for the sample again and you will get a nice layer between the uh, rbc as oh, i'm sorry in between the 45% and the semen sample as well and these three layers are very very important so rbc lysis buffer ha buffer having any osmotic effect on the sperm membrane uh parth you have a very good question here if you are using the rbc ly lysis buffer and you are using it in the correct protocol in the correct time period where you are not subjecting it for a long duration uh 5 minutes is sufficient you would not get any negative effects on the sperm but what i would recommend here is once you use an rbc uh, buffer always wash the sample always prepare the sample post the buffer so that you remove any kind of negative effects using the uh, rbc lysis buffer i personally have not used rbc lysis buffers in my laboratory but where it helps the most is when you are actually using a uh, preparation for uh, tisa samples right so in those scenarios you just add the buffer uh, shweta this should answer your question so just add the buffer to the tisa uh, the minced uh, tisa sample uh, spin it once for 5 minutes and you will actually get a very clear uh, solution post uh, preparation where you will only get like some amount of cells and debris which are from the epithelia or from the testicular tissue but all the rbcs which comprise of majority of the testicular uh, sample will actually vanish and then your sperm uh selection and the sperm uh, picking up the sperms be uh, becomes very very easy in such a scenario uh kubera i'll come to your question i have this slide later on right so this was density gradient now what we've done is you've uh, layered the samples then you have to actually uh, centrifuge it for 15 minutes at 1500 rpm or 500 g's and again this uh, g force is also very very important because in certain centrifuges you will achieve a g force of 500 g's in a lesser rpm especially the smaller ones so in those scenarios be very very careful that you not uh, over centrifuging the sample or using a higher g force because when you're using density gradient it can actually be a little detrimental to the 
sperm as well if not done correctly because there are a lot of studies which say that density gradient can induce ROS can also induce um, DNA fragmentation in the sperm so these are small things that we need to uh, worry about so calculating the g-force is uh, something which is also very very essential just go to the internet and get the formula you just need to measure the diameter of your centrifuge and that will help you in calculating the rpm and the g-force that is required so quickly uh, coming to the advantages and disadvantages of gradient centrifugation now density gradient uh, let's come to the advantages first what it does is that it will give you the maximum amount of morphologically normal sperms into your pellet. So that is something that I'm very, very, that I really want in my laboratory, right? It's relatively easy to do under sterile conditions. It can be done for oligosuspermic men. It will also remove all the leukocytes which are present in the ejaculate. And the preparation time for a density gradient is also lesser as compared to the other techniques so these are the five or six advantages of using density gradient now the disadvantages here are that for the best kind of separation you need a good interface between the layers and that can take some time and that can take some experience there is a risk of contamination with endotoxins because when you're swimming or when you're pushing the sample down using g-force all the endotoxins that are there in the sample will also come down, right? Because they again come to the pellet. So these are things that we need to worry about. And certain scientists, like I mentioned earlier, uh, have claimed that density gradient can have a negative effect on the sperm DNA integrity. So there are still conflicting studies for it, but these are the disadvantages that have been mentioned. When I use swim up, I can only, the only advantage here is that if it's a very good sample, it has great motility, I will get a very clean sample uh, later on as well with swim up and I'll get fantastic motility with swim up. I will not get any kind of non-motile sperms in the pellet. With density gradient, you can still get a few non-motile sperms, non sperms, especially if they are morphologically normal. So they might still come into the uh, final pellet. So uh, that's how you differentiate between swim up and uh, density gradient, especially again when I'm worried about the endotoxins in the semen uh, seminal plasma. With swim up, what happens is that that endotoxin cannot cross the plasma or cannot swim up, right? So, in those scenarios, I would be. Okay, had a small uh, uh, lapse in the network here. Um, so what I was telling you about was that when you use, when you have a very good and a very clean uh, sample, I would generally prefer swim up over density gradient in such scenarios. So that's something that you can also think about when you're using uh, these technologies in your lab. Now, Paras has a question here is, can we use single density in oligosuspermia and hypospermia? Now, this is something that I really advocate against because like I'm going to go back to this slide. Now, like I've mentioned to you earlier that you need to have interfaces between the densities to actually get a good separation, right? So when you are only using one density, so imagine that I'm only using this density and I've loaded the sample here, I will only get a only remove the WBCs which are in the sample. Everything else, because that is the separation that happens at the top, everything else is going to get concentrated below and it will not go, it's not going to give me the best kind of uh, sample from for actually doing IVF or even doing IUI. So in such cases, when you have oligosuspermia, I would prefer doing a mini gradient. Now, what is a mini gradient? What you do in a mini gradient is that instead of having one one ml of these densities, uh, what you do is you reduce it by half. So you have 0.5 ml of 90, 0.5 ml of 45, 
and then especially in cases of hypospermia where the sperm volume is a little low whatever sample volume that you have just load it over the top so at least try and have two densities uh, to be used at all times there is india is probably the only country where we use a double density if you go abroad into any uh, clinic they are all going to use a triple density instead where you have 90% 75% and 40% as the three density so don't really worry about the sample not coming into the pellet but what you need to worry about is that you get the cleanest sample that comes into your pellet and that is why you want really want to uh, get a double density for that kind of a separation now what is the preferable method shweta i'm going to come to your question uh, what is the preferable method for ivf insemination now like i mentioned earlier if i have a very clean sample if there are no round cells or pus cells which are in the sample and the motility is great i would prefer using swim up uh, even for ivf insemination but if at any point i am a little worried about the morphology i am a little worried about the uh, pus cells which are there or even the mor morphology of the sample the gold standard for preparation for ivf still is density gradient right so only in uh, scenarios like you have very very good samples in those scenarios do a swim up otherwise always stick to a density gradient for ivf insemination now coming to the most asked question here is what do you do for infected samples like hiv like hbsag like hcv etc what do, what do you actually do for them now the preferred method here is because all of these samples i'm sorry all of these viruses are actually present in the seminal plasma so we really want to remove the seminal plasma for sure so so what we do here is we do a density gradient first right where this uh, gradient is going to uh, separate out all the white blood cells of normal cells etc etc and also the plasma and once you get the pellet you suspend the pellet in about 0.5 ml of media or even 1 ml of media and then you do a swim up so a density gradient followed by a swim up is something which is recommended for infected samples and again i would generally not use infected samples for ivf i would only want to do uh, icsi for such samples right so density gradient followed by a pellet swim up will probably give you the sample for an infected patient but always always remember that you have to counsel the patient that the risk of transmission still exists you're only going to lower the risk by preparation but it still exists so always have those uh, consents in place now does silica have an effect on fertilization yes silica has an effect on fertilization and even on iui so what you do here is that once you've um, done the density gradient and you have the pellet you suspend the pellet in about 4 ml of media mix it well and then you do another centrifugation for 5 minutes just to remove the silica particles from the uh, pellet and then that is that's going to be your final pellet uh, once you've done the second centrifugation and that is how we try and minimize the effects of uh, silica or percol which whichever density that you're using on your outcomes do you prefer double wash and swim up in case of preparation for ivf instead of density no i don't prefer a double wash uh, in case of uh, in case i'm preparing for ivf because i i will only use swim up in a very limited amount of cases and in those limited amount of cases i am very very sure that the sample is clean right and i the only purpose of swim up is to avoid centrifugation so i don't want to spin the sample multiple times and induce that that dna damage or the morphological damage on that sample so in that is why i would never prefer a double wash but i will only restrict my swim ups especially for ivf for a certain uh, amount of cases right so this was all about the general preparation techniques that we have right but now how do we in, improve sperm preparation and that is also something that we now need to think about so there was this really nice article which came out in 1992 and this really set up the basic um, uh, 
trend for uh, sperm preparation and this was basically the recovery of artificially inseminated uh, sperms from fallopian tubes uh, of women undergoing total abdominal hysterectomy so what what people tried to do was they inseminated women and they then recovered the sperms from the fallopian tube now what this told us was that there was a sperm selection process which was happening in natural conception or even in assisted conception when you're doing an IUI, right? And this natural selection process basically has, so you have your uh, different uh, different barriers uh, for sperms, right? So the first barrier that you have is the vagina or the vaginal environment. So as soon as the sample is ejaculated into the vagina, the sample coagulates as a protective response and waits for the vaginal uh, environment to get alkali alkalized and then only the sperms are going to move up. Otherwise, if this coagulation does not happen, it's going to kill all of the sperms uh, in the vagina itself. And in such a scenario, if you do a postcoital test, which is not done anymore, but in such a scenario, if you do a postcoital test, you will get all dead sperms from the uh, vagina. Right. So that's the first barrier that the sperms have to overcome. The second barrier is the cervix and the cervical mucus. Right. So the sperms now have to cross through the cervical mucus and enter into the uterine cavity. And almost so if I have 10 million sperms here, almost 10, one tenth uh, will only be able to pass through the cervical mucus. So you drastically reduce the amount of sperms which are entering into the uterine cavity. Now, after that, it has to go into the uterine cavity. From there, it has to enter into the fallopian tube. The sperms have to get hyperactivated, high, have to get capacitated inside the fallopian tube at the exact time, and then wait for the egg to come to the ampulla. And once it comes to the ampulla, there also the egg also has selection criteria like cumulus cells, like zona pellucida, like the ulema itself. All of these also act like barriers for uh, selection of the sperm or actually selection of the only sperm which is going to fertilize the egg right so there are so that landmark paper in 1992 actually paved the way for all of the studies which followed uh, which actually uh, tried to demonstrate why these sperms are uh, reducing in numbers and what actually happens during normal fertilization right this slide i've already shown you before but there is a criteria for good selection of sperms what the first few techniques which i mentioned uh, were doing was that they were eliminating seminal plasma. They were also eliminating the leukocytes, bacteria, uh, kind of uh, enriching functional sperms, but we're not really sure if they were doing that. Can't comment on DNA integrity, can't comment on acrosome, but they were selecting based on the normal morphology. Cost effective, yes. Easy and quick to perform, yes. And they also allowed larger volumes of ejaculates to be processed at the same time. But what they were not doing were, again, like I mentioned up right now, they're not selecting based on DNA, not selecting based on the functional capacity of the sperm. And they're not doing anything based on the ROS, etc. as well. Right. So these are the things that we are now going to focus upon. Now, like routine semen analysis gives you certain information like sperm production, viability, blah, blah, blah. Certain of these preparation techniques will depend on certain advanced techniques for semen analysis as well, right? So I would not recommend, so like I mentioned, so if I'm only doing a semen analysis, I don't know the functional capacity of the sperm. So in those scenarios, I have no clue whether to use a swim up, whether to use a density, whether to use microfluidics, whether to use max, etc, etc, etc. So in such a scenario, when you're not getting good outcomes, I would first recommend you improve your semen analysis by adding a sperm dense, uh, DNA fragmentation test uh, to the patient, check whether the uh, DNA of the sperms is good or not, and then only select which uh, technique you want to use in the laboratory. Now, this is a nice paper which was done. Paris, I'm going to come to your question once I finish this uh, presentation. So this is a nice paper which basically compared four methods of sperm preparation for IUI. And these four methods were simple wash, 
single density, double density, and swim up, right? They basically found out that the morphology was best with discontinuous gradient search centrifugation with two densities, but ROS was increased. Thus, this paper actually helped us in uh, analyzing that the decision of using a sperm preparation technique should always be based on the semen analysis and the semen quality of that patient and nothing else, right? And this semen analysis and sperm quality should include DNA fragmentation into the assessment, right? Because we know that there are a lot of potential adverse effects of sperm DNA fragmentation on the, on the outcomes. And that is why we need to think about DNA fragmentation. And when you're using certain techniques in the laboratory, especially when you're using density gradient, it's very, very important to understand that there are a lot of studies which say that density gradient can actually induce uh, DNA fragmentation and also the time for your incubation period. So when you have a semen sample and you're leaving it for three to four hours in the uh, laboratory itself or at 37 degrees, that also induces DNA damage. So your time from ejaculation to your time to insemination uh, should be about 90 minutes in total. No, it should never exceed that. So uh, if I have an IUI, which is scheduled for the day and the male pa patient comes at nine o'clock because the patient has to go to the office. So he go comes and gives the sample at nine o'clock. And then because you have a heavy OPD, you end up doing an IUI at three o'clock or four o'clock in the afternoon. That sample will not have any kind of good DNA sperms which should be left because you've actually had almost a six hour uh, waiting period. And this is this is a scenario which is very common in most of the laboratories because we're burdened with so many patients that we can't really cater to these needs as well. So always understand that in such a scenario, doing an I IUI within that 90 minute window is essential, right? And also understand that once you have uh, prepared a semen sample, you're already hyperactivating that sample. And if you wait for a little longer, you're going to cause an acrosome react, premature acrosome reaction, a premature capacitation, which is something which you don't want. Because again, what happens during capacitation is that instead of the linear motility, the sperm tends to have a figure of eight motility because this capacitation happens where it happens at the ampulla of the fallopian tube, right? And why does this capacitation happen? This is also very important because the ampulla of the fallopian tube contains the uh, contains albumin, right? And this albumin is also a, a component of HTF, which is human tubal fluid, which we're using for preparation, right? So in such a scenario, when you're preparing a semen sample, always inseminate as soon as the sample is prepared. That is something that we tend to follow in our laboratories. Don't try and wait for longer because you will not get good outcomes if you wait for a longer period post preparation. Also something that you need to worry about now is that sperm preparation methods can also affect the telomeric length of the chromosomes which are present in the sample or the um, uh, sperms. So again, this is a study which actually compared swim up and density gradient. And this study found out that uh, when you want to think about the telomeric length uh, of the chromosomes, density gradient is probably better as compared to swim up. So this is again a little conflicting because on one stage you're inducing DNA damage because of density gradient. On the other stage, your chromosomes are actually better with the density gradient as compared to swim up. So this is something which is conflicting and we really have to think about whatever is best for our patients. This is another study. Uh, this is a retrospective study which actually compared uh, your outcomes of IUI. So they what they did was they took all the IUI failures that they had in their laboratory and they did an MSOM analysis. Uh, MSOM basically stands for motile sperm morphological examination. And what they found out was that when you when they did uh, MSOM for IUI failures, they found that most of these patients had morphological abnormalities in the sperm itself. And that could be one of the contributory factors for uh, failures of IUI. And that is why they recommend that you do a high-end morphological examination before doing an IUI 
so that you don't waste time on doing multiple IUIs and avoid loss of time for the patient as well as loss of uh, funds for that patient. So it actually is more cost effective doing a, a higher diagnostic technique before actually subjecting the patient for IUI. Let's come to a few questions before I actually move on to the newer techniques. So Paris has a question, what will we do in hematospermia? If I have hematospermia, I have not seen a case of hematospermia for very long. It's very, very rare. Uh, first thing that I will do is I would uh, refer that patient to a urologist. I would want uh, to see whether the hematospermia is from a fresh bleed in the urethral tract or it's from a trauma which is a little high above or it is just a few RBCs which are coming into the sample because that could be um, from... Uh, any cause as simple as urinary tract infections as well. So I would want to treat the patient first. I would not want to take this patient up for IUI or IVF uh, immediately. So always in such a scenario, refer it to a urologist uh, to get the adequate treatment done and wait for a few months. Uh, generally, an adequate time of three months would be sufficient. Uh, in that three-month period, if the patient is suffering from anything uh, other than um, like poor sperm counts or uh, even poor DNA, I would uh, start empirical therapy to improve those as well. And then I will take uh, the case up for uh, whatever I'm wanting to do with that patient, right? So this is how I would proceed uh, for a case of hematospermia. But if I have a lot of RBCs on the day of preparation, uh, in such a scenario, I would not recommend doing IVF. I would counsel the patient for I, uh, ICSI. I would use density gradient to prepare that sample. Do a swim up post density gradient so that the RBC stay below and only the motile sperms come up. And I will then use that sample for ICSI. Right. So this is this would be my algorithm for um, hematospermia. Which kit is good for DNA fragmentation, which can be used at RT. I'm thinking is room temperature. Uh, there is no kit which can be used at room temperature uh, where you're doing staining because what you're wanting to do with increasing the temperature is that you want wanting to basically denaturize the DNA and then stain that. So in such a scenario, I would not recommend any kit if you're wanting to do at room temperature. If you're wanting to do uh, check for the DNA integrity uh, and you don't have those warmers, I would recommend using the HBA slide, which is hyaluronin binding assay slides. Uh, these are the use the same principle as Pixie. What you do is you just load a drop of sample on the slide, which is already coated with hyaluronin, and let it sit for a uh, for a time. And then what you're wanting to analyze is the amount of sperms which are going to stick to the dish. And this uh, these number of sperms or the percentage of sperms that are sticking to the dish and still moving actively, uh, the tails would be moving actively, should be over 58% or should be actually be over 60%. So that is something that uh, you can use, but it is a costly slide. So again, your cost implications would come to the patient. But again, a staining test would probably be one of the best tests, uh, which I would routinely recommend because you have a documented evidence post that, um, which you can put it uh, on the report of the patient you can give them an image of the fragmented sperms and the non-fragmented sperms and that's something that um, again actually appeals to the patient as well what is the time limit for incubation for ivf or xc after preparation i generally don't wait so i would time my sperm preparation in such a way that once the sample is prepared i immediately use it for uh, insemination. So that is what I tend to do, but never try and exceed 90 minutes from ejaculation to insemination. So at least uh, maybe you have a buffer of half an hour to one hour post preparation. RBC lysis buffer can be used in cases of hematospermia, but like I mentioned earlier, when you're using an RBC lysis buffer, always do a post uh, buffer uh, wash, a uh, post buffer preparation for that sample. So now coming to the newer techniques which are now available in the market for sperm preparation. So the first one is MAX. MAX basically stands for Magnetic Activated Cell Sorting. And what it basically does is that the general principle of MAX is 
that you label the spermatozoa using phosphatidylserine and annexin 5 or annexin V, right? And this annexin V is a marker for apoptosis or it has an affinity for the fast receptor. So what happens is that the magnetic beads which are in the reagent or in the kit have that receptor in them. So all of these sperms which are apoptotic stick to the magnetic bead, right? Once you're mixing them in the sample and then you pass it through a magnetic column, which is something like this. What happens is that the magnetic bead just sticks to the magnetic column, automatically attaching uh, or taking the apoptotic sperm uh, with it. So this is the general principle of MAX. And this is the only technique which is available in the market, which is now separating sperms at a biological level. So that's something that we can now uh, utilize in our laboratories as well. So I have a short video of it. So you've mixed the magnetic beads into this column. You get the sperm sample um, from the incubator loaded onto the chamber. And then it just you just load it onto the tube and allow it to fall, right? and it'll automatically remove all of the apoptotic sperms from the non-apoptotic ones. But generally, uh, again, what is said here is that uh, you want to pair max up with another sperm preparation technique like density gradient in order to remove the morphologically no abnormal sperms from that sample as well. So I would do max followed by a density gradient or a density gradient followed by max in order to get the best kind of sample for insemination. Right. How efficient is MFFS? Uh, can you please uh, uh, elaborate what you mean by MFFS? And then I'll answer that question. Uh, in the meantime, what we want to understand is that uh, Mag Max uh, has been in uh, uh, has been actually started. People started studying Max from around 2005, 2004, 2005 onwards. The first of its studies came out in 2006, uh, 2007, and from there, it has showed a lot of potential. So the studies, we don't have RCTs on it, but the studies say that uh, it improves sperm fertilization potential, it improves the cleavage rates and the pregnancy rates, it results in a higher ongoing pregnancy rate with a clear reduction in DNA fragmentation as well. And it can be considered as a molecular preparation technique, which complements your conventional sperm preparation in order to enhance the success of ART. Paras, I'm coming to microfluidics. So uh, give me like two slides and then I'll be there. So these are the studies which are there for magnetic uh, activated cell sorting. And again, uh, there are Cochrane submissions on this as well, where it's been said that it's safe, efficient, consistent, and might improve the clinical pregnancy rates of the patient. So this is something that can be tried for patients. So this was a little bit about Max. Now, what about the other uh, technique which Paris is now talking about? That is microfluidics, right? So firstly, I'll, I'll demonstrate a video showing how to prepare a microfluidic chamber. And then we move on to how efficient it is. So like you saw here, that's the chamber that is, that is actually being put on a Petri dish. It has four wells in it. And first thing that you want to do is you want to charge all of these wells. So you put 10 microliters of uh, uh, media into each of these wells, and then you remove all of that media so that the channels or the microfluidic channels are charged. Then you load the uh, media as well as the sample according to the protocol that's given. So the sample is basically uh, loaded into well number uh, B and you have the media which is in well number A, right? So the top well is going to contain the media, say bottom well is going to contain the sample and these chambers are like this. So media is going to flow, create a laminar flow. Sperms are going to come from here and only the sperms which have a good DNA content or a good sperm head density can actually cross through that laminar flow. I have a video, uh, I have this in the video as well. So only those sperms will cross the laminar flow and then it gets separated. And the good viable sperms go into well number C 
the non-viable or the abnormal sperms go into well number D. So you just take the sperms from well C and then load it into the um, uh, your ICSI dish and then you can carry out with your ICSI insemination. Now this is for the smaller chambers where you're using only a very small amount of um, sperm sample for separation. There are newer devices which are available where you load the sample uh, over a membrane and you can actually load almost 2 ml to 3 ml of sample over that membrane and then the sperms just pass through that membrane and you can actually use this for IUI. But if you're wanting to use a microfluidic device for IUI, it costs anywhere between 10 to 15,000. So your cost for IUI dramatically increases. So this is what I was talking about. The sperms actually come from well B and you actually are generating a laminar flow from the top and only the sperms which have a good, so the flow is being generated from the top here and only the sperms which have a good DNA content or a good head shape can actually enter into that laminar flow and then they get separated based on based on this right so the separation you can see the abnormal sperms will be going down and the normal sperms with good motility actually swim to the top of the chamber so this is basically how microfluidics works microfluidics again is something which uh, is working on the dna content of the sperm so anything if if you have a poor percentage of motility or a poor, a poor percentage of dna fra fragmentation in such samples, you can actually use microfluidics. You don't need any kind of centrifugation for this. Uh, and you can actually get a good yield. Uh, and the newest studies that are coming up, again, this is a relatively new technology. So the newest studies which are coming up actually say that you're getting very good um, selection based on the DNA content. So this was the device which we were using earlier. This is the newer device where you can use a large volume of semen sample and it just passes through a membrane and such a sample can be used for IUI as well. So you can use microfluidics for IUI, for IVF as well as for ICSI. So this is something that can be done uh, routinely. And like I mentioned, this is one of the most promising uh, technologies which is coming up for sperm preparation. There are so many uh, new varieties of microfluidic devices which are coming up. Some are based on the laminar flow. Some are based on barriers which are placed, uh, which actually are placed in such a way that the they actually remove the abnormal motile sperms. So th it's just fantastic to see the kind of research that's happening in this field of microfluidics. Uh, and that's something that uh, is very, very promising for us. Uh, in the laboratory as well, right? So this, these are the two new techniques which have come up. Uh, my last slide uh, before I have a few questions for you guys is a basic flowchart on all the preparation techniques or the sperm selection techniques that I have that are available and what is basically recommended where and not. And this is a flowchart which was developed at uh, the ISAR uh, embryology consensus where almost 40 embryologists from all over our, our country sat down and deliberated upon all of the advances which are coming in the field of embryology. And uh, I think 27th September is the date when we launch uh, the consensus statement. So do go to the ISAR website and uh, get a copy for yourself. And this is something that would really help you out in your routine practice. Right. So before I come to this flowchart, let's just answer uh, one more question. Would you use process sample and perform fluidics or directly from raw sample? Uh, the protocol says that you mix it with a little bit of media and then uh, use it. Uh, it does not specify in processing the sample. So generally, uh, it's just raw sample mixed with a little bit of media for the smaller device. And for the larger device, it's only the raw sample. So that's what you do for microfluidics, right? So let's come to this uh, flowchart. So what I've done here is I've divided uh, the thing into swim up, density, microfluidics, max, MC, and hyaluronin uh, binding assay or PICC, right? So we start with oligoesthenoteratozoospermia, which is something which is very commonly seen in most of the laboratories. So for oats, 
swim up is generally not recommended density gradient is something which is recommended microfluidics probably not recommended max again is questionable because it it does depend on the count uh, and you want to follow it up with a uh, preparation technique so you will not get the best of the yields so in such a scenario uh, generally the way to prepare the sample would be by density gradient and then doing ICSI or a higher sperm selection technique like IMSI can also be recommended for such patients. For PICSI, oligoestheno is not recommended because you want a sperm count of at least 10 million uh, in your sample in order to do the uh, do PICSI for that patient. So that's why this is what the general protocol and the general consensus is. Now, second uh, scenario here is DFI. Right, so when you have a high DFI, swim up is not recommended. Density gradient is recommended. You can follow density gradient with a swim up. So you can do a pellet swim up if you want to separate based on the motility as well. Microfluidics recommended. Max is recommended. IMC and hyaluronin assays are also recommended in case of high DFI. When you have 0% morphology, or when you have severe teratozoospermia, swim up is not recommended. Density gradient is the recommended choice. Magnetic activated cell sorting can also be recommended in such a scenario. Microfluidics should not be done in such a scenario. MC can be done, PICSI can also be done if the counts are good. For unexplained infertility, all of the techniques can be tried, whichever suits you as well as your patient. So this is based on the kind of sample that you have now based on the kind of procedure that you're doing for IUI you can do swim up density microfluidics max whatever you want to do based on the kind of sample that you have for IVF again all can be done for ICSI again all can be done the source of the sample for the ejaculate you can do everything but if you have a surgically retrieved sperm or a TISA sample then swim up again is not recommended because it's surgically retrieved uh, you will not have motile sperms density gradient can be done in such a scenario or you can just do a simple wash and uh, then just pick the sperms from that sample right so this is just a general flow chart which has all of the techniques all of the types of samples the procedures etc just in one flow chart so hopefully this would help you in uh, like identifying what what you want to do with the case so now look at this sample. I'll come to retrograde. Look at this sample here. And now tell me what would you want to do or what kind of a preparation technique would you want to use for such a sample? So, uh, Shweta says density, Ankita says density. I don't know who AFC is, but that person also says density. So, in such a scenario, when I have such poor motility, I am very, very cautious of doing like density gradient. Only because if I, if I look very clearly at the sample, this is a sample of agglutination, right? There are sperms which are sticking to each other. And this sample is very viscous, so you will not get good kind of uh, sperms in after density gradient. So in such a scenario, if this is a case of IUI, I would really tell the patient to go in for another collection. And most of the times what we have seen is that if you have such, if you do a repeat collection for such samples, it turns out to be much better as the first sample, right? So if it's for IUI, I go for a repeat collection and then decide on what I want to do. But if this is for ICSI, I would just do a simple wash for this uh, this technique, this uh, sample and proceed further. I would not try and do density because I'm not going to get a good kind of separation only because there is a lot of agglutination which is happening in the sample. Now look at this sample. There are no motile sperms in this sample. So 
So in such a scenario, what would you prefer? Esther, probably your answer was for the previous question, a simple wash followed by a swim up. Again, I would not do a swim up. Uh, if I'm just doing ICSI for that patient, a simple wash is sufficient. And I would never be able to get a good outcome uh, based on the previous sample for an IUI. So I would actually want another sample and then judge the quality. Now, in such a scenario, we're talking about sperm preparation here. In such a scenario, when there is no motility uh, and I want to do ICSI for such a case, horse is what everyone is saying here. But if, if you look at the newer uh, techniques which are available, um, motility enhancers are something which can be used. And in such, so this is the same sample where we use theophylin and when you subject the sample, theophyll, using theophyllin is very easy. I'm going to come to the preparation of theophyllin as well. So this is the same sample as the last one where, and you can actually see that once you add theophyllin, the sperms which were immotile actually become motile used by using theophyllin. Now you would ask me what, what do we mean by theophyllin? Theophyllin is basically a motility enhancer. It is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. So what it does is that it acts at the level of the mitochondria and it will increase the cyclic AMP uh, level uh, inside the sperm mitochondria and thus induce motility in such sperms, right? And this theophylline can help you in selection of sperms uh, or viable sperms based on the motility. In other cases, when I have a non-viable or, or a sample which has zero motility, doing a horse is also a little tricky because you would not be able to <clears throat> judge uh, which of the sperm has actually uh, coiling of the tail or which has a morphological abnormality with horse and also horse also has to be done in such a way uh, that it doesn't impact so post horse you actually need to wash the sperms again because you're using a hypoosmotic solution which if injected into the cytoplasm can also cause certain abnormalities in the cytoplasm. It's a good technique to, de to use, but it is becoming outdated now. Uh, the thing with uh, motility enhancers is that uh, it helps you in selection. It's faster to use and it does not like Parth is now mentioning that the impact on sperm DNA can be there. But most of the studies have proven that these are generally safe to use uh, in the IVF scenario. And generally, when I'm talking about generally safe, I'm only talking about theophylline. I'm not talking about pentoxyphylin. Pentoxyphylin has been proven to be unsafe for use in IVF. It's also a uh, motility enhancer. And what was being seen with pentoxyphylin was that it was resulting in more miscarriages in patients. So in su such a scenario, we would want to use only theophylline and not pentoxyphylin anymore, right? Uh, so Xenia, probably that answers your question. So only motility, motility and answer that you use is uh, theophylline. Uh, and as of now, there's not enough evidence to suggest the effect of theophylline on the DNA of the sperm. With pentoxyphylline, obviously, yes, and that has been banned. Right, so this was uh, mostly everything about sperm preparation. I'll quickly come to processing and freezing the gamete, uh, male gamete. So what to use and when because so oh, i'm sorry i didn't cover the theophylline uh, preparation so generally when i am using theophylline i prefer using what genia is saying where i only introduce a drop of theophylline into the into the ICSI dish right and that drop is sufficient to activate the sperms and basically it helps me in my ICSI procedure uh, and it does not actually utilize a lot of theophylline as well. But what, what is generally the protocol is that if you have a 1, one ml sample or if you have a 0.5 ml pellet, just add half the volume of pentoxyphylin or half the volume of theophylline into that pellet, centrifuge it for 5 minutes at 1000 RPM and that is something that can be uh, used. Uh, so post those 5 minutes you will get motile sperms. And you can just, and the only thing that you need to worry about is that the half-life is a little short. So you have to finish whatever you're wanting to do within 30 minutes of the preparation. Now, Kajal, basically you're talking about hypoosmotic swelling test. And hypoosmotic swelling test is basically when you have 
a hypoosmotic solution water is a hypoosmotic solution but i would not recommend using water for uh, hos what basically you do is you dilute the media with sterile uh, water and then you subject the sperms into uh, this solution and what happens is that because it's a hypoosmotic solution water will enter into the membrane of the sperm if it's intact and it will stay there thus causing a swelling of the sperm tail or a coiling of the sperm tail but if the membranes are not intact or the sperm is dead water enters and water goes out because the membrane loses its permeability right and that is why when you're using a host test uh, a normal sperm will be coiled an abnormal sperm will actually look like a normal sperm where you have a straight tail so uh, that's what you can do i have a video for it i'll show it to you once i'm done with the presentation so what can we do and when can we do it so generally when you're using uh, sperm preparation for freezing density gradient seems to be the norm uh, swim up can also be utilized if the parameters are good uh, you can also do raw sample freezing and tsa samples can also be frozen now do you prepare before or after the general gold standard is you prepare before you're freezing the sample because you want to eliminate all kinds of leukocytes etc abnormal sperms from the sample which are going to produce ros generally so general norm is prepared before and that gives you a better yield right uh, the three techniques uh, basically the techniques are simple freezing where you prepared the sample using a density gradient and then slowly you you put the cryoprotectant into the uh, pellet mix it well and then you just subject it to simple freezing where you're putting it in vapor first then at the neck and then you're subjecting it into liquid nitrogen uh for ho tejal i think your question is for horse uh yes it can be used for ixi you just use a horse media which is available from the market i would not recommend preparing your own uh, horse medias in the laboratory because you this is human ivf you would not experimenting in the laboratory so just prepare an a, a, an approved host media and uh, make a droplet out of that host media uh, sample so you mix the sample in the media uh, and you create those droplets into your ixi dish as well right and then just pick up the uh, coil sperm from the host uh, droplet and you can just wash it in pvp once and then inject it into the sperm what i do when i've only done horse once or twice i've not done it more than that but what i i tend to do is that i make a droplet of horse in the ixi dish itself without any sperm i will pick the sperm up from a hippie's droplet take it into the horse droplet see in a real time whether the sperm tail is coiling or not and then if it's coiling i'll inject it into the uh egg so this actually helps me in differentiating a real time coiling from a uh, tail defect so that's something that i uh, when i did horse i've done it like that but whichever way you like how much time in vapor phase 15 minutes 15 minutes and then you dip it into nitrogen this is what we have followed for ages and it's worked really well for us the other way of doing sperm freezing is vitrification this is something that is coming up now the first time we did sperm vitrification was in the video that i'm showing you right now what you do is you take something which will actually restrict the sperm into the liquid nitrogen because you're dropping raw sample directly into liquid nitrogen so we took a metallic sieve and then we drop the sample using a pipette and what it does is it it creates those small bead like structures right and then you just load these beads into the vial and then you can just store it into the sample so this is how we uh, did the first uh, sperm vitrification in our laboratory you can also use devices for it where you can load the sample in a straw or you can load the sample on a cryo loop and then just dip it into liquid nitrogen uh, that can also be done but again uh what the benefit of using these beads is that when i'm thawing i can only take one bead out and use it for exe so i have a lot of extra sample which is left for the subsequent cycles so in those scenarios um this works but again uh this is something that is 
still controversial. We don't have the exact protocols and medias for sperm vitrification. I have a sperm vitrification uh, video for testicular sperm, which I'm going to cover as my last slide. So that's where I will tell you another, the newest uh, protocol, which is available. Right. So cryopreservation can also affect a lot of things like motility, like DNA damage and mitochondrial damage. So this is something that we have, we need to worry about. And this is where max also comes into play. So because if you have an already apoptotic sperm and you're freezing that, uh, it's not going to give you the best kind of outcome. So max or magnetic activated cell sorting has actually been used to optimize sperm cryopreservation as well. So with max, uh, freezing sperm and thawing sperm actually becomes more efficient. Uh, if you understand what I mean. So that's also something which you can utilize if you're wanting to freeze the best kind of sperms or thaw the best kind of sperms. Now coming to testicular sperm and testicular tissue cryopreservation, very important to understand that testicular sperm can be frozen. It's not that you do a diagnostic TISA and then you do a repeat TISA later on and subject the patient to multiple punctures and multiple biopsies. So whenever you have a diagnostic TISA, if you have adequate sperms which are present, please freeze it. Um, you can do a simple rapid freezing, which we, we've been practicing for quite a long time. It's as uh, easy as doing sperm freezing. So use the same protocol uh, where you're taking 0.3 ml of the tissue and 0.2 ml of glycerol, mix it well, and then just freeze it uh, uh, using the vapor as well as the neck, etc. That's something that can be done. Or you can actually vitrify. And this is the newest device which has come up in the market. It's called sperm VD. And this is used for freezing rare spermatozoa. So if you have a case of cryptozoospermia, or if you have a case of uh, testicular biopsies, or uh, when you have TISA samples where very few sperms are present, in those cases, you can use this device to freeze the sample. So what is done here is that I'm going to start the video again, one second. So this is the device here. The protocol itself is that firstly, what you'd want to do is you want to prepare droplets of sperm washing media uh, into your uh, Petri dish, right? And then you want to prepare a drop of PVP just to uh, get better uh, control on your dish, right? The next thing, so this is PVP. This is for better control on your needle. And then you have sperm washing media, which is being put on that dish. Then in another dish, and this is where your ICSI will come into play. I have put sperm wash and sperm freezing media in a one is to one dilution. And only one microliter of these are loaded onto the sperm VD device, right? You tilt the device a little bit so that it becomes a little flat so that when you're vitrifying, it's it's easy. And then you just put it into your dish, which was containing the sperm wash media as well. So sperm wash media, you load the sperm into the wash media. And from here, you can actually pick up the sperm using your micro manipulator and load it directly to the device, right? So this is just an example where Michael here, Michael is one of the guys who does, does a lot of work here. So he is basically picking up sperms from the wash droplet, loading it into the uh, sperm freezing media, which we've created in, into that device, right? And then you basically label that device and you can actually directly dip this into liquid nitrogen. Right. So what you can do here is that you create a vial, you load the device into this vial, and then you directly dip it into liquid nitrogen. So this basically is direct vitrification of rare spermatozoa. Right. So the device just load it to the bottom of the tube, cap it lightly, not, not too hard because you here you want the vapors and nitrogen to go in and just push, put it into liquid nitrogen. So it's as simple as that. And the recovery rates with this is very, very uh, good. We had a recent demonstration of this in Mumbai in July. And uh, actually, you're actually getting about 80 to 80 to 90% of 
viability from uh, freezing such samples and you're getting good blastulations as well. So how do you thaw it? Uh, basically create the same kind of dish where you have PVP and sperm wash and directly place the device from liquid nitrogen back into the dish and then load using your micro manipulator you can just pick up the sperms from the droplet and push put it back into the sperm washing media or you can actually put it back into pvp or you can directly do uh, wash it in pvp and directly do xc in the same sample same dish so this is the newest uh, device which is available for sperm vitrification and rare freezing rare sperm allows uh, sperm freezing with minimum preparation minimum manipulation and gives uh, good outcomes as well. So uh, this was the last slide of my lecture uh, and uh, hopefully uh, you had a great webinar and you actually learned something out of this webinar. Now we have about 10 to, 20, 10 to 15 minutes where we can have a discussion. So if you have any questions, now would be the time to actually uh, answer. I'll be able to answer that uh, in this duration. So just type in your questions regarding any kind of uh, sperm preparation technique or any problems that you faced with sperm preparation, etc. And uh, uh, we'll have a discussion. Okay, so the first question is, uh, what is the recommendation for a recommended cutoff for count, motility and morphology recommended for IUI? Now, if you were not there in my last webinar, I'll just open one of those uh, slides that I have uh, because we had this discussion in the previous webinar as well. So there is this fantastic study which came out from William Omblet uh, and he basically uh, divided or took into uh, consideration uh, only the inseminating motile count. Right, so what do we mean by inseminating motile count? Let me just open the flowchart for you. Okay, right, so have a look at this flowchart. Now, when we are, when are we going to do, let's focus only on the no tubal factor because this is when we are going to do the IUI itself, right? So when the patient has no tubal factor, and you prepare the sample using your washing procedure, whatever uh, preparation technique that you're using, and then divide them based on the inseminating motile count. So inseminating motile count is basically when you have uh, the motile count in your post-wash uh, semen sample. So the inseminate volume into the post-wash motile count is your inseminating motile count. So let's say my insemin inseminating volume is 0.5 ml or 0.3 ml, which I basically use for IUI, multiplied by the post-wash motile count. That gives me the IMC or the inseminating motile count. Now, if my IMC is more than 1 million, right, I can easily go ahead and try three to four cycles of IU I IUI without a doubt. So the cutoff for I IUI is IMC of more than 1 million. If you're not comfortable using IMC, use TMSC more than 5 million as your cutoff, right? Then if my IMC is less than 1 million, but my morphology is good, right? So my count is less, but the, the amount of morphologically normal sperms in that count is good. I would still go ahead and try for three to four cycles of IUI. But if my IMC is less and my morphology is also bad, then straight away go to ICSI. So this is what you can do for uh, preparing samples based on the count as well as on the morphology. Right. Let me see the other question if I can find the slide for retrograde here. Because retrograde also there is a preparation technique to follow. Give me one second. Okay, I don't think I have the slide here, but let So our protocol for retrograde ejaculation is that you firstly alkalinize the 
a patient a day prior. So you give alkalizing agents like Alka-Sol uh, to the patient a day prior to the sperm preparation or the sperm preparation technique modality, whatever you're using. And what you want to do on the next day is you ask the patient to void urine first, right? So he comes into your clinic, he voids uh, the urine sample. Then you ask him to drink some water, whatever, so that uh, the bladder is a little full. Then he is asked to ejaculate and then pass urine sam urine again into the container, right? Why are we wanting him to void the bladder first? Because we wanting to not get a large volume of urine sample into the container, right? So you want him to actually avoid of the excess urine sample, right? So second, so the next thing that you do is you ask him to ejaculate, you ask him to pass urine sample into the uh, container. As soon as it comes into your laboratory, centrifuge it immediately at uh, 1500 RPM for about 10 minutes, you will get a pellet, discard all of the urine from that, mix it with 3 ml to 4 ml of media, centrifuge, mix it well, centrifuge it again, and the pellet that you get, then in that pellet, you will try and identify sperms. Now, most of the times when we've tried to do preparation for retrograde, we've had sperms which would not be motile, right? Why would they not be motile is because urine is also hyposmotic in nature and it will again cause swelling of the tail. It will cause the motility to vanish. So in such a scenario, doing a horse uh, ICSI would again be beneficial. All right, so this is just a general protocol that we follow for retrograde. Gaurav has a question, single versus double IUI. I, and generally all of the clinics that I visit, uh, our protocol is always single IUI post ovulation. So we, we um, give the trigger, monitor the ovulation around 38 to 40 hours, uh, post the trigger, we will do the IUI. Management for globozoospermia. Now, this was again discussed in the previous webinar. So I will send you a link for the previous webinar as well. But when you have a sample for globo, always understand that these samples will not cause fertilization, right? Unless and until the oocyte gets activated because these, these sperms lack PLC zeta, right? So you always need uh, assisted oocyte activation for such patients. So you use a calcium ionophore uh, media for this. What you do is you do routine ICSI where you have injected these sperms into the eggs and then culture these eggs for 15 minutes, 15 minutes in a calcium ionophore media and then you shift them into normal culture media. So this would actually help you in improving the uh, fertilization rates. Maximum time allowed for preparation to insemination. People tell it's five minutes. So the maximum allowed time I generally feel is that you do it as soon as possible. So generally what we do is when we have uh, an IUI patient, as soon as I'm ready to do the second step or the last step of sperm preparation, which is just the wash, I will inform the clinic to take the patient inside. And in the meantime, when they take the patient inside and the doctor changes, my five minutes of preparation is done and we do it immediately after, right? Because the longer you wait, the longer the sperms have to get capacitated, et cetera, and your outcomes are going to get uh, lower. So that is why I would recommend uh, as soon as possible post of post your insemination. If you're wanting to delay, I would recommend not to prepare the sample. Keep the raw sample, preferably at room temperature, not even at 37. So you keep it at room temperature. And once the patient is ready, the doctor is ready, then start your preparation. So this is actually going to help you in preserving the sperm motility, the sperm um, the energy of the sperm, et cetera, and allowing you to actually delay the uh, IUI a bit. So this is something that can be done. DFI, uh, we don't recommend it for all IUIs. We recommend it only for three IUI failures. So that's what our protocol is. If the patient has three failures, that's when we are doing uh, DFI. Or we do it when you have a uh, positive lifestyle history. So if, if he's a known smoker, uh, or a known chronic smoker, or if he's had miscarriages, or if he's had, if he's working in a high heat environment, all of these things, um, then looking at the patient history, etc., I would probably do it before doing an IUI. 
for hiv patients is triple density with swim up 100% safe no it's not 100% safe there is still a risk of transmitting the infection and that is why you really need to uh, take a consent from the patient that um, you do going to do all of this which might reduce the risk of transmission but there is obviously a risk of um, transmission which we can't rule out so 5 to 10% risk is still there so in such a scenario having that documented makes a lot of uh, difference 2% of normal sperm will you recommend the patient to go for PISA PISA is something which I don't recommend in any scenario because especially in cases of obstructive uh, ASU uh, only because uh, the sperms are stagnant in the epididymis for a long time so when you compare PISA and TISA and then you do a DFI for PISA uh, samples and TISA samples there have been studies which say that uh, the DFI is higher in PISA samples and that is why I would not recommend doing PISA. I would prefer doing TISA over PISA. What is the reason for count? Uh, what is the reason if count is reasonable and you get 0% motile sperm? Again, Kubera, I'm going to share you a link for uh, the previous webinar, which was all of these abnormalities in the sperm. But generally, uh, for asthenospermia, uh, the causes can be firstly a very high uh, abstinence period and this is very common. So especially if you have not counseled the patient correctly, there are times where the patient right from down regulation to your pickup, they would not, they will have abstinence and not even ejaculate. Then they think that uh, because they are abstaining for such a long time, uh, the count is going to increase the the motility is going to be better, all of those things. But that's not true because the sperms are stagnant in the epididymis for so long, uh, the ROS levels in the epididymis rise, compromise on that sperm DNA and the sperm mitochondria, and that is what can result in and can be one of the causes for uh, asthenozoospermia. Second cause can be necrozoospermia. It, it is a rare disorder where all the sperms are dead, right? So in such a scenario, doing a vitality test is also 100% important because you want to differentiate between asthenozoospermia and necrozoospermia. Asthenozoospermia can still be treated using motility enhancers or HOSIC-C, but necrozoospermia you will not be able to treat. In that scenario, you will only be able to do donor IVF or donor IUI. So that's where this differentiation is important because we don't want to advocate the use of donor samples for such cases as well. Third scenario can be genetic where you have a disorder like cartagenous or you have an immortal cilia syndrome. Uh, so in such a scenario, what happens is that the dynein arm of the uh, the sperm tail inside the sperm tail uh, that goes that is actually detached. So the sperm does not have the ability to move. So in such a scenario, also you will get zero percent motility. So these are some of the causes that are actually more. I, I can send you the link to it. Can you discuss some equipment you use or recommend? Uh, I'm not sure, Gaurav, uh, what kind of equipment that you're talking about here. But generally for sperm preparation here, we basically are, we, we only have started using microfluidics uh, to improve preparation now. Um, we only stick to density and sperm swim up uh, as the preferred modalities for sperm preparation as of now. And only in a few recommended cases, we are trying to use microfluidics. I don't have Max in my in my clinic, so I don't have experience with Max. But I've seen how it works. I've seen how to use it. But generally, I have not had the opportunity to use Max in the system. Ankita, I will send you the links of the previous. There were four webinars which have already been conducted. This is the fifth one, so I'll send you a link for all four of them. If you have any more questions, we can have a few more. Vijay Lakshmi has a question which says that a patient 30 years, count 30 million, normal morphology, no motility, how to proceed, no varicocele, no inguinal hernia. Again, I've already covered how to proceed. So first thing that you want to do in this scenario is use uh, or check for vitality of that patient. So you do a staining test. If the vitality is more than 58%, I would recommend uh, horse ICSI or pentoxifylin ICSI for that patient. If the vitality is also very bad, like if the vitality is also 0% and is necrozoospermia, I would recommend um, um, counseling the patient for donor. 
which microfluidic slides are giving good outcomes there are only two devices which are available in india one is from trivector and the other one is from sar healthcare and i think uh, we don't have data to actually differentiate between the two uh, the difference is that uh, the trivector device can uh, uh, have a larger volume of sample so you can use it for iui the sar healthcare device uh, use you can only use for xc can we use albumin free media for wash in in the last stage use hsa media yes you can do that and that probably will help you in reducing the hyperactivation of the sperm i have never run i have never done that so i don't have experience in it but logically speaking it should be beneficial uh kantha what are the basic equipments and machines used for an andrology lab so what you want to have in an andrology uh, a uh, laboratory is a laminar air flow preferably a vertical uh, laminar air flow uh, is recommended you can have a 2 by 2 or a 4 by 2 whatever uh, space uh, you can actually give to the laboratory i think i think the cost difference is not that much so if you have good amount of space use a 4 by 2 if you don't have in that much space use a 2 by 2 um, laminar air flow you want a microscope uh, a light microscope in the uh andrology laboratory you want a centrifuge uh, generally uh we prefer to have one temperature controlled centrifuge and a one uh, non temperature controlled centrifuge uh in the uh, in the andrology so that if one fails you have the second one as backup um i don't uh, recommend having an incubator or even um, like an incubator in the uh, andrology lab most of the companies do sell you uh, hot air ovens or incubators as part of the iui lab setup and they say that where will you keep the sample you have to keep it at 37 you have to only keep it in the incubator so these are just the, just tactics which companies use to sell uh, equipment but generally an incubator is not required if you're only starting an I, iui lab you can easily store these samples on a warm uh, table general recommendations of sample storage are actually at room temperature uh, so that can also be done so these are things that you need to worry about these are the only equipments that you need right so if there, if there are any more questions uh, i can take probably one more thank you for your comments i will send you the links for the previous uh, webinars as well and thank you all for sparing some time uh, to attend these webinars these webinars are part of uh, dr sadna desai's course for embryology uh, which happens in bombay there are 15 to 20 candidates which are taken up uh, every year and they actually spend one year with us out of which one year four months are actually in a clinic uh, which is recommended and certified by isar so if you are thinking about doing embryology that's one of the courses which i would recommend and you can go to the isar website and uh, get more details of it we are also doing a lot of uh, embryology courses uh so the next one is an advanced embryology course which is going to happen in bombay it's from the 23rd to the 26th of uh, september is going to cover advances in cases of failures uh egg freezing and also embryo biopsy so the if you're interested if you're already practicing embryology this is one of the courses for you we're also doing uh certification of embryologists uh, so a lot of us do uh, try and go for ishre certifications and international certifications but now uh, we have a certification which is recommended by the indian society of assisted reproduction and what is going to do here is that you come to the laboratory you have to do 10 uh, ixes in front of the assessor and you also have a multiple choice questionnaire um, and if you clear both of the practical as well as the theory you will get certified uh by isar as a ixi practitioner or a specialist in vitrification or also get certified for embryo biopsy so if this is something that you are interested in uh, please do visit the isar website uh, and uh, you can get the brochure and the details from there i will send the previous webinar links to all of you and uh, hopefully uh, i'll see all of you in the next webinar as well so thank you so much for coming and hope you have a great sunday and uh, see you next time